Hi folks, let's take a piece of P20 semi-hardened tool steel. Let's use a high feed end mill to machine that into a centripetal mold. And let's see if we can make a car key fob mold. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. So there's a bunch of awesome stuff in this video, the first of which is this DieJet High Feed Mill. We found this at the Tormach Tech Days event last year, and High Feed Mill is awesome. You've probably heard by now this thing called chip thinning. And normally when we talk about chip thinning, we're talking about chip thinning on the sidewall or the radius or the side of the tool card here to the NYC CNC page where we've got our free Excel speeds and feeds worksheet as well as this video where we talk about what exactly is chip thinning. So high feed machining is chip thinning, but axial chip thinning. We're chip thinning on the face of the tool, not the side of the tool. We're taking a wide cut, but very thin. And in this case, that's a half inch tool. We're stepping over 0.3 inches or about 60%, but we're only cutting 10 thousandths of an inch on the depth of cut. This is a new tool to us, so we're still experimenting with speeds and feeds. I do like this recipe though. 450 surface feet per minute, five thousandths of an inch feed per tooth. That's about 52 inches per minute feed rate. So the first thing we're doing is facing off this block of P20. So what is P20? The first place I like to go when I'm looking up a new material is actually McMaster car. Tool steel. Expand this about steel. And under the tool steel category, we've got some really good basic info. If we look through here, we'll see hardened, easy to machine P20 tool steel. So even though it says easy to machine, this is still a phenomenal quality steel. You'll notice it's got the highest yield strength. That's a great thing. And it's about 26 Rockwell in its current state. We didn't buy this though from McMaster, but rather card here to the NYC CNC page on our guide to buying raw materials. And this piece we picked up from a company called Hudson Tool Steel, one of the best companies out there for buying small amounts of your various tool steels, D2, A2, O1, in this case, the P20. What I like about Hudson is they've got open pricing right there on their website and you can buy via an online cart, no need to open accounts or deal with distributors. We've got our part faced off, and you'll notice we did take a test cut off camera just to make sure we had some of our speeds and feeds dialed in on this recipe. And next, we're opening up this large area, and when I first saw this toolpath, I thought, boy, that's gonna take a long time. That's a lot of cutting, but we're moving relatively quickly. And if we look at the fusion machining time, it's actually only six minutes and 30 seconds. And again, this is tool steel that's actually fairly hard. Similar recipe, same speeds and feeds, and again, we're stepping down in increments of 10 thousandths of an inch. And we're doing this on the Tormach 770, and it's such an awesome testament. One of the things that's great about high feed machining is it works great on running a tool steel on a machine like the 770 and really getting pretty good material removal rates, but also well, this is a mold, so I do wanna focus on surface finishes as we work through it. So we've machined most of that center cavity. We'll do the other half when we flip the part. Next up, machining those key fob pockets. So we're starting out with a roughing tool, a 3 16 end mill Lakeshore carbide, 200 surface feet per minute, or about 4,000 RPMs, 2 thousandths of an inch feet per tooth, which is about 32 inches per minute. Going back to our more traditional speeds and speeds recipe where our optimal load is about 15% of the tool diameter and our roughing step down in this case is about 50% of the tool diameter or about 0.09 inches. When we're doing a 3D adaptive though, I want to take advantage of the 3D nature. So we've got a minimum step down of five thousandths of an inch and a fine step down of 10 thousandths of an inch. And what that's doing is it's helping rough out the inside fillets, still leaving five thousandths radial stock, which we'll come back and clean up later with a ball or bullnose end mill. But nevertheless, I want to hog out, or get rid of most of that material with this relatively strong, thick tool. And the key to this whole thing is pattern. We're just machining one pocket right now. And we went through all of these operations in Fusion first, but they're inside of a circular pattern. And this is one of the cool tricks with Fusion 360 is under that pattern, I can choose keep original. So after we got this first one done, I just unchecked keep original after I had made all the little tweaks and adjustments going through again, just the first one to complete it, 
we get a ton of questions on speeds and feeds in general, as well as for steel on the Tormach machines. So for our NYC CNC Pro members, we recently updated our Tormach steel tool library. But really the key that we have found is Use smaller diameter tools, quarter inch is usually the largest that we'll use, and you can run those tools fairly hard. For example, one of our go-to recipes is this quarter inch diameter stub length five flute end mill from Lakeshore. It says that it's for stainless steel. It's actually really for mild steels as well as stainless steels. So we'd use it for things like 1018 or 836. It's got a small corner radius, which I really like. That helps increase the strength of the corner of that tool by getting rid of that sharp point. And we'll run this tool between two and three thousandths of an inch feed per tooth, which means you're really cooking. In this case though, because we're using a tool steel, if we click on the carbide end mills, variable four flute for tool steels. And so there's a number of difference between these two tool geometries, but the one that matters the most here is how sharp the edge is. And the five flute tool happens to have a sharper edge that helps you shear in either softer materials or gummy materials like stainless. The four flute here for tool steels or 4140, has a slightly more honed edge, which means it isn't quite as sharp, but it's gonna hold up a lot longer. And so regardless of where you buy your tools from, something like that is worth knowing. Build that relationship with your tooling vendor or your sales rep or whomever you buy for it. Fight the right battle. Make sure you've got the right tools for your application. Overall though, I was really happy. I was a little nervous about how would this P20 machine in general and how would we do with it on the Torwalk? And so far, working great. Next up, another adaptive strategy. This time, we're stepping down to a 1 16th inch tool and under geometry, we've got rest machining check that's going to machine all the areas of remaining stock that the larger 3 16 tool couldn't get to. Really cool to see the motion profile and the machine move with these small tools and these small cuts. And again, it's a 1 16th inch tool, it's tool steel, but it's machining beautifully. Until there. So what happened? I didn't check my tool run out. Any tools under one eighth of an inch, you're gonna benefit from checking the run out. And when they're one sixteenth of an inch or smaller, you really have to check the run out. Chucked up a new one sixteenth inch end mill. I've got my Mitutoyo tenths indicator. Rotate the tool backward and you can see we're six tenths low on one side and we're at zero on the other side. So we're gonna to come to what's the high side or zero. We've got a flat blade screwdriver with just a piece of electrical tape just to prevent that metal on metal contact. We're going to put that screwdriver blade against the shank of the tool and using a small brass hammer, we're actually gonna tap that tool into place. And this blew my mind. Card here to when we machined the Lego mold and we first started experimenting with this. I can't believe that it works, but it does. I was fussing with this off camera though and we couldn't get it to where I was happy. I ended up taking the collet out, cleaning it, rotating it, putting the assembly back together, and we got that run out dialed into a few ten thousandths of an inch. We did a quick flow strategy with a one eighth inch ball end mill. That created the gate for the material to flow through. And then we're moving over to the pencil strategy. 1 16th end mill, this time though a ball nose end mill, and we're using pencil to clean up a lot of those inside fillets. Card here to the NYC CNC page where you can download this CAD and CAM file and go through these tool paths and look at more details and settings on your own. Okay folks, so I broke a tool, let's do a simulation. And you know it's funny because I've often professed and recommended folks do this, I'm guilty of not doing it, and there you go, look at that. Now that's easy to see here because we're looking for it, one of the better ways to have checked this would be on the top left of your screen, turn off the light bulb, and now you really see it. Sometimes your CAD model backfilling, especially when the simulation is a different color, can really screw you. So let's turn the light bulb back off again and find out where is that tool path. Oh, there we go. It's a linking move in that flow. Gosh, or that pencil. Darn it. Yeah, look at that, the green line just blows right through it. Let's fix it. So this is actually an awesome example. We've done a couple of good videos on using patch as a way to improve 3D servicing tool paths. It bit me here because under geometry, the model I have is just the four faces and that's 
means it's not Fusion's fault. It's my fault because it's only looking at those four faces. So it doesn't think there's anything here to worry about, which is why it did a linking or rapid move right through it. So we can see the old toolpath was taking into account that dish and it really shouldn't have. And it was that, in fact, this interruption in that cut that was causing it to do that green linking move right through the key fob part. And what bothered me was that shouldn't have been doing that because we were actually using patched faces. So you can see that it should not be aware of that. And so this is one of the cool things. And we've got a lot of video tutorials over on the NYC CNC website on Fusion 360 Cam, both in the dropdown, but also if you go to the library, you can search for things like we'll click Fusion 360, 3 axis Cam, and you can see all these various examples on things like toolpath containment, improving surface finishes, and so forth. So again, the trick here was actually really simple. It's usually simple after you figure it out. Ironically, it was to delete the machining boundary. We don't need it because we've told it the only thing you should think about as being part of the model is this surface. Now, one caveat is because we're only using this patched surface, it gives us this great toolpath, but it's not going to be what I would call model aware. So there could still be a problem either now or in the future if we change something where it did, does another linking move because it doesn't know or isn't aware, doesn't see the rest of this solid model. But look at that nice toolpath. And last but not least, we're using the Lakeshore 20 thousandths of an inch diameter engraving ball end mill. We've had a lot of success with this tool um, over the past year, year and a half. Running it with all the RPMs we've got, which is 10,000, only one thousandth of an inch feed per tooth. We're taking it easy, given that this is tool steel, that's 10 inches per minute, and one and a half thou depth of cut. What I like about this tool is it tends to leave a very crisp looking engraving without raising a burr. So we've got to repair this mold where we crash that tool. And that means filling back in the material that we removed in that crash. And the two ways that came to mind were either a glue or TIG welding. I wanted to leave the part set up for now, and so I didn't want to TIG weld it. And I thought, you know, given what we're doing as a centripetal mold, I think a simple two-part epoxy should work well. So we mixed up some JB weld after cleaning out the mold really well. We let that cure, and then we ran a very special setup called Glue Fix, where we ran the same pencil tool path that cleaned up the uh, outside edge, and then I created a 2D contour to walk across the top to clean up the glue along the top, and it ended up working out great. Drilling our through holes, some of these will become pins for alignment and others will become screws to secure the two mold halves together. 125 surface feet per minute, about two thousandths of an inch feed per rev. Actually drilled really nice. I was really happy with how that turned out. Let's flip this first part and we'll finish machining the through hole where we'll pour the smooth on urethane. P20 tool steel is definitely overkill for the task at hand here of building a spin mold. But like so many of the things, what I wanted to do was see, can we do it? Can we do it on the Tormach? How do we get tooling? How do we get speeds and feeds? So this was the project that we picked to test that out. We machined an identical second version. The only difference is we didn't engrave it as this will be the backside of the key fob. Hey, quick and easy, rotate the bridge port. Ed came up with this idea, throw the right angle head on it. Now we have a vertically facing controllable RPM platter. Again, quick and easy. And if it works, we'll build a dedicated motor and platform, which will also be fun to do. But again, let's uh, fail fast, fail cheap.
We've tried a few different smooth on compounds. We'll put those on the NYC CNC page. We threw a bucket around the part to protect us as we poured from any of that material flying around. And let's see if it worked. So apologies for a crummy GoPro settings, but it was amazing. It definitely worked. We had a little bit of flashing around there. I think surface grinding or even stoning down the mold will help a little, but the quality was amazing. It gives me the confidence to know, hey, I think we're onto something here. Hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care, folks. See you soon.